everybody for being really patient with us while we sort it out. Some technical issues. I had hoped to show you a few films. I had them on my rolled up on my laptop because I'm streaming them off websites um, where they're better than I can't take them off. But we're just going to have to go without the films today. But that's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so my talk in my in my abstract for this, I said that I would be talking about 100 years of auto archaeologists. And I was going to make two arguments. One, that archaeologists have always been filmmakers and members of the media um, with a filmic voice. And two, that we've even managed at times to develop that voice into an auteur's voice. Um, the first is an easy argument to make. So we'll uh, take you on a tour through ar uh, archaeological filmmaking over the last 100 years. Um, the second is more of a theory that I'm testing out. So this seems like a really appropriate area, space, to kind of test out this theory um, this is not what my whole PhD is about, it's a tiny part of my PhD, so if you disagree with me, if you see holes in what I'm saying, please pull me up on it, because that's what I want, I want discourse, um, and I want us to basically take a look at auto theory, take it for a walk, put it down somewhere else, which is on archaeological filmmaking, and see if it sticks, and see if it can show us something new as well. Um, so firstly, auto theory, what is auto theory? Um, really, it's an umbrella concept for how we understand authorship in filmmaking, but also in other creative practices. So originally, authorship was actually about composing and about music, and then it became about filming in the 1950s, but it's also used in web design and gaming as well. So hopefully, we'll see some parallels in, in people's experiences of author, authorship um, across lots of different mediums, and we can um, see, see some, um, have a dialogue across mediums. Now, autorism is usually considered to have its roots in terms of kicking off uh, in the 1950s French film criticism and the concept of the auteur first appeared in the journal Cahiers du Cinema um, as part of a wider backlash against the increasingly commercial assembly line approach to the production of French films, which directors claimed uh, at the time uh, that they were being treated as little more than stage setters and technicians. Um, and so filmmaker and critic... Francois Truffaut uh, claimed he, he was one of the proponents behind auteurism, uh, and he said there are no good and bad movies, only good and bad directors. Uh, so he was shifting the focus from the production company and from the writer to the director, the visual author, um, as the primary author of films. So in many ways, auteurism didn't even start off as a theory, it started off as a manifesto and as a backlash against something else. Um, and then... Yeah, and the argument that these auteurist critics made was that um, the director should and uh, could and should put their personal imprint on their work, thus privileging the visual language of cinema over, for example, the written script or adaptations of other people's work. At the time, um, musical uh, theatre was very popular in terms of adaptations for films. Um, so now, because of this argument, film could be a medium for personal expression, or as Alexandre Astruc put it, directors should use the camera uh, like a pen, basically, um, and that the personal voice of the director should become also the standard of reference for film criticism. Um, so it was also not just about production, but about how we receive uh, and how we, cri how we critique and how we judge the value of a film. Um, and that personal voice could manifest itself in a variety of ways. It could happen in terms of aesthetics of that particular director, in terms of their style, their technique. Um, recurring themes is a really big one. So their philosophy of life, their thoughts, their politics, their worldview, but also through their having a significant level of control over production. And I would add to that over dissemination as well. Um, and then autourism took a bit of a slight turn when film theoretician Andrew Saris introduced it to the US, now as a theory with a capital T. Um, in, his notes, in his article, Notes on the Auteur Theory in 1962, um, and he wanted to use autourism as a criteria. Uh, he wanted to further the use of it to judge films. Um, so he had this uh, approach, which is that you had sort of three layers you had to look at. So the outer layer is that to be an auteur, or to sort of make that level, you had to have a basic level of technical um, competence and technique and craft in filmmaking. And then the next step was that you had to have a distinguishable personality that be can be seen in the aesthetics of your film, in your style, but not just of the film, but across a director's body of work as well. Um, and then finally, that the director could create interior meaning in that film by blending their own personality with the material they're working with. 
Um, so that material could be script actors, it could be um, the physical material they're filming. And auteurism, you know, took a lot of turns and twists since then. Um, it, there was a big backlash against it as well. Uh, there's a lot of criticisms of it in terms of like people commercialize auteurism now. Uh, the backlash kind of happened when women and minority directors kind of kicked off and, and started tapping into auteur theory, so there's a whole discourse about that. Um, but there's a whole legacy of it, which is that film could, oh, whoops, jumping ahead, film could, as a uh, consequence of auteur theory, be treated and valued as art, not just as mass-produced entertainment. So there's this high culture, low culture discourse, um, and also the legitimization of film as art. Um, also, that directors had the rights and responsibilities of authors. So, for example, in European copyright law, films are still um, attributed in terms of ownership, at least in part, to the director. That's not always the case in television, and it's not always the case in other regions. Sometimes that ownership is trumped by production companies. So these are the sort of things where it's making a real-world impact. Um, so it's, it's not just like high theory, this is, this is law, this is responsibility. These are our personal responsibilities to the people we're filming and to our audience as well. Um, to muddy the waters, however, in practice, things get a bit messy. So for example, on the new, no, no Film School website, which is kind of like an online bible for any independent filmmakers, they provide a broad definition of auteurism, which I think is how things work in practice, which is that they make the point that the auteur, or the key author, might not actually be the single commercially credited director, but can also be an individual or very small um, collective of individuals whose single vision drives that piece of work. Um, so that it cuts through the business, it cuts through uh, the limitations of production, um, and that voice ties all the other aspects together, still maintaining unique, consistent, recognisable aesthetics, style, values, control over production, all of these things. Um, so, back to archaeology. What has auteurism and auteur theory <coughs> got to do with archaeology? By considering the history of archaeologists involved in film and television through the lens of auteur theory, we can start to see how archaeologists have actually retained their own personal voices as the driving force behind certain film and TV productions. Admittedly, the cases I'm going to share with you today are probably exceptions to the rule, and they might not gel with a lot of people's experiences working in film and television um, or being associated with film and television productions. But they're still real. They still stand as evidence of the privileging of the archaeologist's voice as the key author, and so they can offer important lessons to us about how authorship works and how we can make use of it. So, uh, oh, and I just want to show... Oh, my alarm's going off, sorry. Um, I just want to show this picture, just as a little nod that, um, you know, we've had filmmaking in archaeology going back at least to 1901. This is the earliest version I've got. Um, and we don't always have the records for who made what. So that's something we have to acknowledge as well, is that there's probably a lot more that's been made by archaeologists that we just don't have the records for, or it's raw footage. There's stuff that's being um, collected and digitized by archives constantly. So it's sort of like, this is a body of evidence that's only going to grow. So um, my first case study is Reginald Campbell Thompson, and credit must go to Amara Thornton and Michael McCluskey from the Filming Antiquities Project for bringing this uh, case to my attention. And you can see some of their works in citations in the short series, but you can also look them up online. They're doing some amazing work with uh, early archaeological footage. Uh, Thompson was an Assyriologist and an archaeologist who was an employee of the British Museum and who directed excavations at Nineveh in Iraq in the late 1920s and early 30s. Oh, jumping forward. Um, the film we're discussing, I had hoped to have it playing, but you can look it up online. If you go onto the Filming Antiquities website, they have a link to it, so you can just watch his footage. Um, it's attributed to Thompson as an author, and it covers the period of excavation, and it shows the excavations of the Tell of Kulyunyuk and the series of local uh, scenes of local life at the local village, which was in the boundaries of Nineveh. It's carefully edited, it has purpose, and although Thornton and McCluskey point out that we don't know if it was ever publicly screened, when you watch this film you can see that it was edited probably with a purpose for sponsorship, so this was probably something that was used um, as a lecturing device, uh, and it probably was shown to audiences. Um, you can see in his work uh, you know, an influence from ethnography, from ethnographic documentaries like uh, Nanak of the North, 
Um, and also, you can see really a basic level of... You can't see it, <laughs> but trust me, there's a basic level of technical competency. His work is still amateur. That's not bad. That's, that's natural. You know, amateurism is something we need to value. Um, but you can see that there is care in the edit and basic visual literacy. There's also, I think more importantly, values and themes in his work about um, things that only the archaeologist's eye would catch and would spend time on. So, for example, he spends a lot of time recording um, the, the washing of potsherds and even giving commentary in the title cards of, you know, that, you know, it's being done correctly or not quite correctly. Um, you know, these are the sort of things that only an archaeologist would care to comment on um, and, and commit to film. <laughs> um, and, and also he provides the wider social and political context of the dig and that actually ties into his publications which were also kind of ethnographic accounts of at the time so, so you can see these themes across his body of work so this is sort of, I wouldn't say he's an auteur but I'd say he's an example of steps towards auteurism um, but Jaquetta Hawkes is definitely, I would say, an auteur uh, in the late 1940s, after sound but before television, Jaquetta Hawke's full feature-length film, The Beginning of History, which went for about 45 minutes, demonstrates the increasing clarity of archaeologists' filmic voices. Hawke's biographer Christine Finn details how, with funding from the Ministry of Education, and she worked with a director, so she herself was not director, but she worked with Graham Wallace and the Crown Film Unit to make uh, a film. She conceived of the film. She wrote the script. Um, it was an educational feature for classrooms, but you know, uh, and it was a it was an account of British prehistory from Wessex to the Orkney Islands. Um, and she she really worked as a producer. She thought of this film in terms of a package. So she also made sure that it came with poster boards, it came with models and film strips that would be shipped out to schools. So she was thinking, you know, about the film as a story and then everything around the film. And she was very concerned about receiving criticism from her archaeologist peers. Uh, she went to great lengths to achieve um, a sense of archaeological authenticity uh, using on-site footage um, of the actual archaeology sites, animated maps, text captions, um, photography from the archives, and she even had built a full-sized reconstructed set of Little Woodbury's Iron Age farmhouse. This was built at Pine, Pinewood Studios, and they even did helicopter flyovers of it. Um, and she gives her an account of, her, of, of the production as well. Um, so I think this is really important that she was able to drive for all of these and she was aware of what her options were but that she, t she, she started with the idea and she saw it through to completion so she had control over production um, and she also went on and made other films outside of archaeology like <coughs> she made a really nice film about Barbara Hepworth which is online yeah it's really beautiful it's called Figures in a Landscape and again you can see you can see her voice across these different productions um, so yeah, you can see, yeah, she might not have been credited as director, but she maintained her voice as the writer. She gets her say in the edit, she thinks as a producer, and that's where the power uh, lies many times. Uh, Glyn Daniel <coughs> is another perfect example. Um, he picks up where Hawks left off. He, works, he worked in radio, and then he worked in television, which was a new medium, so he had a lot of room to play with, really. He started, many people will know, he started an animal, vegetable, mineral, um, and he and Mortimer Wheeler both won Television Personality of the Year in the mid-50s consecutively. Um, and it's really interesting, one of the BBC commissioners at the time even said that the most exciting things on TV was uh, show jumping in archaeology. So, <laughs> you know, like they made, they made a really big impact. And he went on to host uh, Buried Treasure. But what I'm interested in is that in 1957, he took the next step beyond presenting um, and he actually became a founding director of the board of Anglia Television. Uh, and this allowed him to produce another two uh, archaeology television series about England's prehistory, Once, was a, uh, Once a Kingdom and Who Were the British? And they were both picked up by ITV. And then in 1966, the BBC actually created an archaeology and historical unit and invited him to become their archaeological advisor, and he was for the next 11 years. So he was, you know, a master of the medium. Um, and he was also, just like Jaquetta, able to sort of push the boundaries of what was done in terms of filmmaking. So he used all the, all of the tools. I, I wish I could show you the footage because it's great that I was going to show of him because he's literally holding like 
they have a um, model of Stonehenge uh, <laughs> that's movable and they've got their pipes and they're sort of like using that as the diagram. So it's like really early days of TV, um, but very creative uh, ways of, of representing archaeology. They use toothpaste and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but in, in one of the first uh, programs, um, one of the professors, Professor Plenderlife, wanted to demonstrate ultraviolet, uh, the ultraviolet light process that was used in the British Museum Laboratory for the study of manuscripts and drawings. And so he pushed for that, and that was the first time the BBC ever uh, televised ultraviolet light. So again, you can kind of see you know, people pushing for things and using their voice to push archaeology on screen. Um, okay, I know that I'm probably running a little bit short. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip forward. Um, I know I said I would do 100 years, but I'm just going to briefly acknowledge um, time team is obviously a factual format. That's really the opposite of auteur theory and auteurism, um, but because it's a formula, you know, it's a formula that's repeated every week and the directors change. Um, so it's, it's really not the same thing, but broadly speaking, I would say Mick Aston had a very <coughs> auteur-like imprint on that television series. Um, and there's a quote from him, he says, I never made any money out of it, but a lot of my soul went into it. And that to me is, you know, that's, that's textbook auteurism. Um, he imprinted himself, his philosophy, his worldview, um, and his thoughts so much into the fabric of that production that the show simply wasn't the same without him. Um, so he wasn't the director, but alongside the producer, Tim Taylor, he was perhaps one of the closest things that Time Team had to having a central motivating voice. Um, other honorary mentions include uh, Dorothy Garrard, Alexander Keeler had some amazing stuff from the 1920s, you can only see it um, at the actual BFI, uh, Jacques Cousteau, so many archaeologists have been involved in a range of productions, Lucia Nixon made work out at, um, did stuff out in Greece, Angela Puccini, you can see some of her stuff also in citations and online. Jean Caviel, Colleen Morgan, you know, we have a lot of people who are experimenting with film. As we've seen today, we've got some new uh, filmmakers with us as well, um, who use archaeology and uh, who use filmmaking as more than just a tool and as more, more than advertising and who imprint themselves into their works. Um, so what I hope I've demonstrated today is that archaeologists have always been filmmakers and members of the media with our own filmic voices and styles that we've cultivated and refined over the course of the last hundred years and that at times some of us have even managed to develop that into an auteur's voice, um, whether we're credited as directors or whether it's indirect. Um, so any notion of needing to take back our discipline from the media, which is a debate which often happens out in the archaeological literature, out in the literature, in the archaeological literature, um, that claim kind of falls flat once we realise that we are the media. You know, um, also as publishers, we are the media. Um, so we have a distinct filmic voice um, or multiple voices. We've been able at times to control the means of production uh, and we can learn from these instances. Recognising this, the question can then become if we have an authorial voice or even at times an auteur's voice with all the rights and responsibilities that come with that, uh, then how should we use it? Hopefully some of my colleagues will be able to speak to that following this. Thank you.